It's a great pleasure to welcome you all here this morning. Uh, those of you who are here present and the uh, even larger number of people who we understand are watching uh, the live streaming of, of this event. Um, we have a special event for you this morning. Uh, this is a conversation uh, with Undersecretary of the Treasury for International Affairs, David Malpass. Uh, the CSIS Americas program and, and Matthew Goodman's International Economics program are co-hosting this event. I'm Michael Matera, the director of the Americas program. Our program has been particularly engaged on Mexico, Canada, and NAFTA, Brazil, Argentina, Colombia, as well as on transparency and anti-corruption policy, drawing from the positive experiences of Uruguay and Chile. We've also had an active engagement uh, with the Caribbean and Central America. And lastly, Venezuela has been a key focus of our program. Um, we've welcomed the, the regular participation of Treasury officials in our roundtables on Venezuela, including Deputy Assistant Secretary Mike Kaplan, who's with us today. Um, on Venezuela, the issue of sanctions uh, has been a critical focus of our work, and we'll, we look forward to hearing what Mr. Malpass has to say on the subject. Treasury's Undersecretary for International Affairs is sometimes referred to as the department's top financial diplomat. David Malpass has responsibility for the implementation of policies um, regarding international finance, investment, trade and financial services, as well as international sanctions policy. In previous periods of government service, Mr. Malpass served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Treasury under President Reagan and as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State under President uh, George H.W. Bush, or Bush Padre, as those of us in the Americas like to refer to him as. Uh, he was particularly engaged in these positions on Western Hemisphere policy and is widely seen as one of the, the administration's key experts on Latin America. During these years, he worked on an array of issues, including NAFTA, the Brady Bonds, uh, and the 1986 tax reform. He later served as chief economist at Bear Stearns, after which he created his own economic research and consulting firm, Encima Global. In 2016, he became a senior economic advisor to then presidential candidate Donald Trump before being named as undersecretary last year. David will be speaking to us today about US policy towards the Western Hemisphere with an eye to three important events taking place later this year. The Summit of the Americas in Lima, Peru in April, the G7 Summit being hosted by Canada in June, and the G20 Summit taking place in November in Buenos Aires. This concentration of focus on the Western Hemisphere led Secretary of State Rex Tillerson yesterday in his first speech on the region uh, to call 2018 the Year of the Americas. The eyes of the world are on the Americas as Tillerson departed last night for his first week-long swing through Mexico, Argentina, Peru, Colombia, and Jamaica. This morning, we'll hear another perspective on the Western Hemisphere from a true expert on the region. Without further ado, I'd like to turn the floor over to, to David. Uh, Matt Goodman, who holds the CSIS uh, Simon Chair, will be managing the Q's and A's uh, after the introductory remarks. If we can all give a warm welcome to Undersecretary Malpass. Thank you very much, Michael. And thank you all for uh, coming and to, to, for the invitation to today's uh, conference. It's a true pleasure to speak with so many colleagues, Latin America experts and those interested in such an important part of the world, and one that is featured prominently in both my per personal and professional life. I'm especially happy to see my good friend, Senator Mark Kirk, uh, who has worked so much on the region. I would like to thank the CSIS uh, for hosting this discussion, and especially George Farial, Michael, Matera, uh, Matt, uh, and the rest of the CSI te CSIS team for the hard work that went into this event. I will use the time today to discuss the importance of the U.S. relationship with our southern neighbors, initiatives we have underway to build that relationship, and challenges presented by China's non-market activities. This year, 2018, the Year of the Americas, marks a critical period for the region as voters in many of Latin America's democracies head to the polls to choose leaders and policies to provide better opportunities for prosperity and security and to, ad to address slow growth, corruption, and crime. 
Following important visits by President Pence and Secretary Tillerson, the region is hosting key events, including the Summit of the Americas in March in Lima and, near the end of the year, the G20 Leaders Summit in Buenos Aires. Secretary Mnuchin will be in Argentina for the G20 meetings in March and will visit elsewhere in the region. And to the north, in Canada, Canada will be hosting multiple events for the G7, and I'll be headed there next week. In each of these engagements, the Trump administration will continue to de demonstrate our commitment to promoting faster growth and higher median incomes in the hemisphere and improving our economic ties through trade that is fair and reciprocal. Many countries have made progress in strengthening their institutions and economic policies, and we look forward to working with the region to build on the shared values that have defined our hemisphere, the pursuit of greater economic opportunity and prosperity in peace, security, and dignity. It's important to note that while citizens in 33 of the 35 countries in the Western Hemisphere have chosen democracy, autocrats in Venezuela and Cuba have chosen to rule through repressive dictatorships. In Venezuela, a topic I will return to in a few minutes, the United States joins the members of the Lima Group and the European Union in demanding free and fair elections to reduce that country's slide into dictatorship and poverty. In Cuba, the Trump administration condemns the absence of the voice of the people in the leadership transition. In his speech yesterday, Secretary Tillerson reiterated President Trump's policy to support the Cuban people by steering economic activity away from the military, intelligence, and security services, which disregard the people's freedom. One of the most important achievements of 2018 in the Americas would be to see political and economic freedom for all citizens of the Western Hemisphere. There's a welcome improvement in the backdrop for the region's growth due to the acceleration in U.S. growth and the broader rebound in the global com ec economy and in commodity prices. An ongoing moderation in inflation across the region, in part due to more stable exchange rates, should allow monetary policy to play a supportive role in many countries. However, sub substantial challenges remain. The desire is to achieve higher median income, reduce poverty, and allow the rapid innovation necessary in the 21st century. This requires many changes, increased investment, including infrastructure, improved education and human capital, a sweeping reduction in the regulatory barriers that are diverting growth into the informal economy, stronger institutions that can help reduce corruption, and, of course, better trade policies. For this vision to become a reality, each country will need to make sound policy choices that create strong long-term investments. With global capital markets robust, there's an opportunity to secure favorable, transparent financing and work toward market-oriented systems that add to growth. In that context, I would like to address China's activities in the Latin American region. China has grown to be an economic force in the world economy, and for many years, the United States welcomed and supported its gradual liberalization. China's growth contributed to global economic growth, and the hope was that China would develop into a fair and reciprocal trading partner. However, the direction in China has clearly shifted. Market liberalization has stalled, and certain policies and activities have even moved back toward a more state-dominated economic model. While China professes to embrace globalization and openness, in practice its markets are relatively closed. China's industrial policies also can have serious implications for countries tempted by its massive non-market export controls, export credits, and loose financing terms, especially if their governments and institutions aren't robust. The vast majority of China's foreign direct investment, its development finance, and overseas development assistance is oriented toward resource extraction and the infrastructure that facilitates resource extraction. In many ways, China is resurrecting the regional growth model of the past. 
83% of China's imports from Latin America are raw commodities with no indication that it is shifting its demand to higher value-added products or helping partner co countries move up the value-added chain. Non-market Chinese investment undercuts the incentives of recipient governments to improve their business environments, their governance structures, and macroeconomic policies. Financing deals too often, financing deals too often consist of long-term contracts for commodity exports at prices favorable for China, not the exporting country. An analysis of foreign direct investment data as measured by the World Bank's Rule of Law Index suggests that while global FDI flows are, cor are, are correlated with quality of governance, the Chinese portion of FDI is agnostic, meaning it, it China invests without regard to the quality of governance. I want to make clear that engagement with China could benefit the region if the terms were fair and projects were market-oriented. China has invited the CELAC group to join the One Belt, One Road initiative, yet this would likely have more benefit for China than for the people in those countries. As Secretary Tillerson said yesterday, China offers the appearance of an attractive path to development, but in reality, this often involves trading short-term gains for long-term dependency. Rather than help reform governance and macro policies, Rather than help reform governance and macro policies, China's investments have too often enabled poor governance. Let me highlight here the case of Venezuela, China's largest investment in Latin America. Most of the blame for Venezuela's economic collapse and humanitarian disaster falls squarely on Venezuela's rulers. But China has been by far Venezuela's largest lender, supporting poor governance. The result will raise the ultimate cost to the international community once Venezuela returns to democracy and economic reforms. China dominated, denominated many of its loans to Venezuela in barrels of oil. This has the effect of masking the exact amount of payments that China made to Venezuelan officials and that Venezuelans are expected to make to China in the future. If you ask China for its terms of finance, you will fi not find them, as China has refused invitations to join the Paris Club of Bilateral Creditors, in which the disclosure of financing terms is the norm. China similarly has avoided subscribing to the OECD norms that apply to export credit agencies. Separately and also, we are concerned about the IDB's initial selection of China as host for the 2019 Inter-American Development Bank annual meeting. The bank's 60th anniversary is an important milestone to celebrate the bank's accomplishments in the hemisphere, and it would be fitting to hold the meeting in the hemisphere among major donors and borrowers. Let me turn now to Latin America growth initiatives. With 2008 summits in Peru, Canada, and Argentina, the Americas has a unique opportunity to highlight significant regional progress and signal to our citizens and our international partners a strong, prosperous direction for the future. We see these as opportunities for the region to renew its commitment to the ideals of democracy, transparency, human rights, and the rule of law, ideals that so many have dedicated their lives to upholding and that will lay the foundation for a century of greater prosperity and security in the region. These events also offer an opportunity for the United States to renew its political and economic bonds with the countries of the region and renew a relationship that has matured over the decades to reflect a true partnership based on a shared desire to see each other succeed. As part of this relationship, I will discuss a number of hemispheric growth initiatives that Treasury and the administration are working on. Together, they could be named America Cresce or the Americas Grow.
The initiatives increase trade and investment in energy and infrastructure, expand private investment flows, uh, and develop deeper regional capital markets. We want to encourage a return to democracy in Venezuela, help increase transparency, and combat corruption to improve the business environment, and support the Northern Triangle's efforts to address economic and security challenges and stem the impetus for illegal immigration. Working with the region, we aspire to greater economic opportunity, higher median incomes, and a strong respect for the rule of law. The anchor for growth in the region is the region's need for, excuse me, uh, the anchor for growth initiatives is the region's need for energy and infrastructure investment. Um, they are both in the U.S. and abroad, these are high priorities for the administration, high objectives, and critical to broader growth. With that in mind, we are developing a multi-part approach that will promote U.S. exports of energy and energy infrastructure, attract investments in the region in the areas of energy and infrastructure, and with, with new ideas for U.S. businesses to participate, uh, this should catalyze private capital for the financing of these exports and investment projects. We envision an increase in both primary market project financing as well as secondary debt trading and asset management activity. Beginning in Latin America's priority markets, framework agreements will seek to deepen the America's energy markets. More, uh, more details are in my printed speech, which I think will be on the CSIS website uh, today. Country frameworks within this initiative will vary with the host economy and the opportunities. The purpose is to build open, competitive, resilient, reliable, and efficient markets while expanding U.S. exports of energy and energy infrastructure. Affordable energy will stimulate economic growth and strengthen regional political and energy security. Some countries are net exporters, but could benefit from a framework agreement that would expand U.S. investment in power generation, transmission, refined products, and energy infrastructure, as well as other infrastructure. Number two, Treasury's Office of Technical Assistance already has programs underway in 16 countries in the Western Hemisphere focused on building public financial management capacity, improving the soundness and supervision of banking systems, and strengthening implementation of controls to combat economic crime. As we engage with countries to expand our trade and investment in energy, we may be able to provide technical assistance in areas that support energy and infrastructure reform, uh, reform, as well as the development of investment frameworks consistent with best international practices. Number three, the Lima Group and democracy. Our democratic allies in the region should know and anticipate the benefits derived from embracing and promoting democratic practices. Likewise, autocrats and dictators should know and anticipate the consequences of undemocratic practices and illegal acts. We applaud the leadership of the Lima Group countries that have rejected the Maduro regime's auto autocracy and pressed it to accept humanitarian relief for the people of Venezuela. We will continue working with our partners in the region toward free and fair elections and the provision of humanitarian relief for the millions of victims of the Maduro regime. Through our financial sanctions, the United States will not permit U.S. persons to participate in Maduro's liquidation of the Venezuelan economy and mortgaging of the country's future with crippling debt. Another set of Treasury sanctions targets Venezuela's enablers in the Cuban military and intelligence services. As Venezuela has collapsed, we have seen the hollowness of its attempt to project its influence in the region. We are gratified that Petro-Caribe recipient countries have had time to adjust to Venezuela's inability to deliver on its promises, as recently seen with Jamaica's Petrojam. And we hope that countries in the region seize the opportunity to diversify their energy imports, including to more efficient natural gas.
It's important that the Lima Group remain steadfastly committed to the principles outlined in their statements. Decisions taken by Venezuelans, Venezuela's constituent assembly should not be recognized. In light of this, we are concerned that the Corporación Andina de Fomento, the regional development bank may, called CAF, uh, may provide significant new financing to Venezuela's central bank outside Venezuela's constitutional processes, supporting Venezuela's autocracy and putting CAF's own finances at risk. Number four, combating corruption. The region confronts a scourge of corruption and criminal networks that prey on our peoples and weaken our economic potential. The echoes of the Odebrecht scandal continue to reverberate throughout the region. I see room for optimism in that many countries have taken important and public steps to acknowledge and address the scandal. If the public reckoning taking place in several countries helps lead to stronger checks and balances, it will ultimately strengthen democratic foundations. Uh, strong institutions require integrity and the faith of the public. The OECD, through its recommendation on public integrity, emphasizes that this is not just a moral issue, but ultimately is intimately tied to economic growth and prosperity. Number five, NADBank. Treasury is committed to better utilizing existing institutions to create the potential for faster growth in Latin America. We're exploring a new strategy with our Mexican partners in the North American Development Bank uh, to focus on economically impactful projects that could include projects in the energy and transportation sectors that fit the NADBank's mission and would improve economic conditions in both the U.S. and Mexico. Number six, NAFTA modernization. As part of the administration's efforts to modernize North, the NAFTA, Treasury is working to ensure that NAFTA will contribute to strong domestic and international growth through a high quality financial services agreement and protections against unfair currency practices and competitive devaluations. Number seven, the G7 and G20. Following the global financial crisis, the G20 group of major economies provided a central forum to discuss the various responses. With the global financial system more stable and world growth accelerating as structural reforms are implemented, we've asked the G20 to focus its activities on a few core objectives. We look forward to engaging with Argentina to help the G20 promote debt transparency and sustainability, coordinate actions to counter illicit finance, and help focus the Financial Stability Board. Within the G7, we place great value on our, our dialogue on key strategic challenges, including cybersecurity, illicit finance, and development finance. On the latter, the increased availability and lower cost of private sector financing requires sweeping reforms of the financial model of the multilateral development banks, some of which depend on repeated capital increases, taking them away from their mission. Number eight, regional investment passport. We see tremendous opportunities to unleash, unleash additional private capital flows for investment projects that would help deepen primary and secondary market development in the region. I would like to applaud uh, the four Pacific Alliance countries, Mexico, Chile, Peru, and Colombia, for having already taken ambitious steps in this direction. We stand ready to work with the Pacific Alliance and other countries to expand on these opportunities. Number nine, correspondent banking dialogue. The ongoing evolution of the global financial system has impacted the connectivity of correspondent banking relationships in many parts of the world. The United States remains committed to encouraging access to the U.S. financial system to support economic growth and financial transparency while enforcing U.S. laws and regulations. We continue to engage bilaterally through the work of the, and through the work of the multilateral bodies such as the Financial Action Task Force, so-called FATF, uh, as many countries explore different policy, pol policy and tech technology solutions. We recognize that improved communications and the exchange of experiences uh, and best practices will help better inform the policy dialogue. 
Here, too, Treasury is actively engaged in supporting the efforts of many countries in the region through technical assistance. And number 10, tools for disaster risk management. The United States has worked for many years with our partners in the Caribbean and Central America to encourage sustainable economic growth and financial stability throughout the region. As each of us grows, we all benefit. Natural disasters such as earthquakes and hurricanes present a risk to that growth. They can create large unplanned costs and represent a major fiscal shock, particularly for small economies. Um, there are many tools to explore. Countries can examine ways to reduce their risks and improve their response when a disaster hits, thus minimizing long-term economic damage. Countries should examine, also examine financial tools such as country reserve funds and contingent credit lines. Insurance tools can also play an important role by providing a quick injection of liquidity to support recovery efforts in the immediate aftermath of a natural disaster. One of the most, and number, number 11, one Northern Triangle investment. One of the most important challenges for the region is in conflict affected regions such as the Northern Triangle countries of Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. We welcome Mexico's strong interest in improving conditions along its southern border and look forward to opportunities in this regard. The Overseas Private Investment Corporation, OPEC, has recently affirmed its commitment to catalyzing private sector investment and is developing a pipeline of up to a billion dollars in investments for the three countries, thereby mobilizing a critical source of finance that will help stimulate these economies. Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador are grappling with the economic and security challenges that have forced so many of their citizens to leave their homes and risk their lives in search of economic opportunity. Last year, Vice President Pence met with the leaders of the three countries to underscore support for uh, addressing these challenges, and in turn, the Northern Triangle countries committed to macroeconomic stability and to take increasing responsibility for financing their own development. A government-wide effort is underway to help countries generate better economic opportunities by improving business conditions, combating corruption, strengthening institutions, bolstering macroeconomic stability, and reforming tax systems. Ensuring that the Northern Triangle succeeds in its efforts is a goal shared by many stakeholders in the region, and Treasury is partnering with Mexico's finance ministry to co-chair a process to deepen coordination with other donors such as the IMF and the World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank to help support reform efforts in the three Northern, those three Northern Triangle countries. In conclusion, the U.S. government recognizes a high priority on our neighbors and their growth. We think investment, trade, markets, and democracy are critical. We welcome strategic and sustainable U.S. investment in Latin America. Thank you all for the opportunity to present these initiatives at CSIS today. I welcome our continued dialogue, and I would be happy to answer questions. Do you want to have a seat? Uh, seat there. Yep. That's fine. Okay. My good side. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Terrific, uh, Under Secretary Mapas. That was a really uh, very rich um, speech, and there's far too much in there to uh, to be able to. Uh, to, to probe, I'd like to ask follow-up questions about all 10 of your points, but that's going to be difficult. We're going to have to have you back to do that. But let me try to um, ask a few uh, questions about some of the things you talked about. So first of all, you painted a, and, and Secretary Tillerson, as you mentioned, painted a similar picture of, of China's position in Latin America that is, um, you know, rather dark, uh, it sort of echoes or it feels like a kind of a a picture of a neo-colonial position they're trying to reestablish there. You didn't use that term, but others have. Um, is this something that um, you think China is, what, what, is going to, what is going to change that dynamic? Is it going to be that China is going to find that that model fails and that they uh, get pushed back or they you know, don't achieve their own longer term objectives? Is it going to be because others persuade them uh, to do something different? Or is it going to be because we offer an alternative to the region uh, that is more attractive? Uh, 
I think that's a good topic for discussion. I think all three are, are the answer. So as uh, what, what I find as I talk with other countries, so in, in Europe there, and in Latin America uh, in particular, but also in Africa, there's a growing recognition that what China is doing is not ending up uh, helping the people of the countries. So there's uh, what, one thing I think that can help China find its way back to a liberalization path is just is the response of the world to recognize that what it's doing is, uh, is, uh, 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 is questioned, uh, that, uh, that they can't continue to just work with governments, sometimes the less robust governments, as I said in my remarks, uh, that th at some point there has to be a connection that will end up benefiting the people of the countries. Um, whether China can do that, how many, how many years does that take? We'll have to see. Uh, the commitments that it made as it joined the WTO are not being fulfilled. That was to be engaged in the international community in a reciprocal way where, so, I, you know, the, the, let's talk about the specific uh, challenges um, that, uh, that the world faces. China is using state-owned enterprises, which are non-market actors that are large and powerful, and yet are uh, that are more uh, following the central plan or the 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 uh, the, the uh, uh, communist party leadership rather than market forces. They're using subsidies, very large export credits, which then dis distorts. Uh, market-based activity around the world. Uh, and one of the concerns I've raised is as China's economy grows larger, you have more of the world's capital being deployed in a non-market fashion by, by a very narrow group of um, non-elected leaders in, in China. So that means world growth is slower than it could be uh, if there were more um, uh, market liberalization in China. That's our hope. We continue to have a, a dialogue, uh, 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 you know, a, a candid dialogue with China. The I met with the finance minister yesterday, uh, and uh, uh, he, he, he's here in, in, uh, uh, in Washington. And so that, that dialogue, I think, uh, can, can uh, share views uh, but the critical thing for the world to, to uh, uh, understand is that it's not in their interest the direction that China has decided to head. So are the, um, the, the, the international um, instruments that may be available to, to, to deal with some of this, you touched on some of them, like the OECD, for example, and export credits and uh, the Paris Club and so forth. China is not a part of those organizations, uh, so, so that's a question in terms of whether they ought to be in there, whether there's another you know, way to persuade them on those issues other than using those instruments. Then there are other organizations China is in, whether it's the WTO or the World Bank or ADB or other um, uh, regional uh, organizations. Um, are, are we, is, is that um, a place where we could uh, try to uh, work to change Chinese practices or their approach to these, these issues? Or, uh, we can. Or we need to mobilize sort of ad hoc coalitions to do this? We can and we do try to uh, uh, have dialogue with them and have the uh, international organizations uh, point out uh, the, that uh, China's market liberalization is often moving, moving in reverse at, at present. We've, uh, 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 so we've set up, you, you note that they're not in the Paris Club. The Paris Club is a, is a group of official creditors that share data so that people can understand, so that countries can understand how much debt they're taking on. One of the cha problems China is, is causing is it's giving loans, but the governments themselves have trouble knowing who made the promise, who signed the loan documents, what are the terms of the loan, and is it actually a, uh, uh, a, a, a proper loan uh, they, since they don't participate in the Paris Club, there's not an ability for people to help them find transparency. So the world, in order to accommodate China's disinterest in doing that, set up what's called the IWG, the International Working Group, which does include China. So we have regular dialogues with China that occur often in Rome uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, try to uh, get China to recognize that simply piling debt 
onto countries uh, in order to do projects that are often not done with proper bidding practices. So they, they benefit what China wants to sell, but not what the people of the country actually need. Uh, that, that process so far, China has simply not wanted to uh, be responsive in. So we're looking for different forum, uh, fora to, uh, to, ha to talk with China, but recognizing that they are not very responsive in, in moving toward, uh, norm toward market behavior uh, within the global climate. Okay, so back on the region yep. itself um, and growth, you, you put a big emphasis on the, the, um, uh, the importance of increasing growth and, and opportunity and, and incomes and so forth, and that makes total sense. Uh, and the, the region seems to be doing a little better, but not spectacularly well. Uh, and, you know, there do seem to be quite a few risks out there, uh, um, whether it's Venezuela, which is still is in kind of free fall and, and uh, um, not, um, you know, uh, certain whether it's going to be a big economy potentially that could be a, a, a big factor uh, uh, for risk in the region. Is that your biggest concern in the region? Are there other risks that you're worried about to growth? Um, what, what do you think is the, the biggest problem for the region? I would like to see each country growing faster and the people, and as I pointed out, the median incomes going up. So it's not just GDP growth, but it's actual growth of, of uh, people's wages uh, and their living standards. Uh, Venezuela is, is one of the biggest uh, uh, disappointments and disasters. You know, it has the, Venezuela has the potential to be a wealthy country. They were in the past uh, and, and uh, they continue to have sizable uh, resources that could, be, that could be used for the people's benefit. But their oil production is going down to the point, as I mentioned in my remarks, that Petrojam, that the, their, their, their uh, participation in the Caribbean now is becoming a, a negative, a burden on those other countries. Still, Cuba is supporting uh, Venezuela with personnel to, uh, to protect the, the, uh, the Maduro regime. And so it's unclear that there's change change underway in terms of moving toward democracy. I, w I wanted to single that out because if you had Venezuela growing faster or beginning to, to stop its free fall, that would help Colombia, that would help Brazil. We should be aware there are refugees uh, fleeing Venezuela because of the government's policies. And so they end up in Panama, in, 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 uh, uh, in Colombia, in, in Brazil, uh, and that creates a burden on their neighbors. And so that's been why there's solidarity within Latin America to try to get a change of regime in Venezuela and also to get uh, Cuba to recognize that this is, this, and, and Russia and China, which are Venezuela's supporters, to recognize that this is just a losing, that they're losing money, they're losing uh, uh, credibility in the world community for continuing that support. So the region has been prone to, to shocks uh, over uh, well, my entire professional career. There have been, there have been many shocks in Latin America. Uh, what, do we, what can we do about uh, those uh, buffering against those shocks? And, and particularly, is the IMF uh, an important player here? And what could the IMF be doing differently? They've talked about a number of different insurance instruments. Um, are there other efforts that the IMF could be doing to improve the situation against shock? I uh, they, they, they're, we've advocated within the IMF that when it does a, an, uh, a program with a country that it focus its conditionality on the things that will actually create uh, uh, substantial constructive change. In, in other parts of the world, uh, at times, there will be IMF programs that simply have too many conditions and the governments aren't strong enough to actually be implementing those. So you end up with a, a less than optimal result. Uh, w in Latin America right now, there's uh, less of a focus on, uh, on uh, uh, financial crisis and more, I think, on getting growth and investment. That's the, so the thrust of my remarks today was the U.S. Uh, uh, interest in policies to participate in the region to really create new growth. So we, we have <coughs> a, 
a luxury in historical perspective of, of having fewer crises than sometimes are confronting places around the world. And that means an opportunity then to come up with new growth solution. So we're talking about framework agreements that will be very important in unlocking the potential of the region. There's, there's just, you know, I, from U.S. companies, we hear often that they can't do business in certain parts of Latin America either because of the regulations, because of corruption perhaps, or because of the financing techniques are not there for them to be involved. And that, we think, can be, uh, can be improved through, uh, through, uh, uh, through the relationship with the U.S. Um, so that's one part. And I do want to mention World Bank and Inter-American Inter Development Bank. Yeah. They, they and USAID are important uh, development uh, players within Latin America. And all of those programs, I think, can be improved in terms of the quality of the loans. Sometimes the organizations are looking more to make loans in order to, to notch them, in order to uh, have, have a bigger book of business, uh, when I, I think there needs to be real scrutiny of the, of the actual programs so that they meet what's needed by the people in the, in the various countries. Uh, yeah. Well, I was going to ask about the, the banks and, and, and the World Bank in particular, um, to be a participant in this is going to need capital and, and there is talk of a, another capital increase at the World Bank. What's the U.S. position on that? What, what would be the conditions uh, that would be required for you to support, us to support um, a capital increase at the World Bank? Uh, I mentioned in my remarks that uh, we, we, we uh, have a, a world environment that's uh, financially more stable than in the past and in fact has much more private sector capital available. So what we've asked the World Bank to do is think about its finance model and, and the, its dependence on capital increases at a time when the world actually has lots of capital and what it needs from the World Bank is, uh, is high quality loans, technical assistance, uh, the grants that come through the Inter-American Development Association. So we're, we've, we're, 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 we've uh, asked the World Bank to uh, think about and, and provide plans for, uh, for, a, for a concept of the World Bank that wouldn't be dependent on capital increases. Okay, using its balance sheet in a, in a more efficient way, perhaps. Um, uh, oh, well, uh, there, that, there, there's a lot to follow up there. That would be approach, and I, I would say also that, uh, that it can find lots of efficiencies within, within, uh, it, within its business practices that would, uh, and also, I mean, a critical point, um, I, I, I'm sorry, but I, I didn't want to stop with balance sheet uh, with that. Uh, more important for the for the bank is to recognize that there needs to be rotation in its choice in its uh, in in borrowers as they are successful. There needs to be graduation of successful borrowers so that there's there is capital available for uh, countries that are that are lower on the uh, on the income uh, uh, schedule and that simply has not been done and that ends up draining the resources for countries that don't need it in the current world environment. Okay, well there's lots more to talk about in that area, but I want to touch on a couple of other things in your uh, remit uh, as, as undersecretary there, one of which you touched on in your talks, which is exchange rates. Um, and you talked about stability of exchange rates, and that's something that Secretary Mnuchin also emphasized in his um, remarks in the IMF um, annual meetings last fall. And that struck some observers as uh, potentially a, a pretty significant change in, in, in approach because flexibility was always the, the sort of the, the word of the day on exchange rates for many years in U.S. policy. Is this a significant change in, a, in approach and outlook to foreign exchange well, matters? Um, it's, th there was, there is an opportunity now as the world grows faster and the financial system is stable to recognize that the stability that's, uh, that's been occurring on exchange rates is uh, a result of good policies, a result of, uh, and, and that it contributes to growth and investment around the world. So that was uh, the basis for the IMFC communicate that was, uh, uh, that, that, uh, that many countries agreed to in, uh, in October. And so it's a recognition of the, of the, of the 
uh, opportunity provided by the current stability. So we have many currencies around the world that are, that are stable and that coincides with the improvement in growth and investment going on. So we, we wanted to, to uh, take note of that and that was uh, done in that communique. Also, I went to Vietnam in, uh, uh, in November before the president's uh, uh, trip and the, uh, the communique of the APEC, which is the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Group, it's the finance ministers of, so many of the finance ministers of Asia uh, uh, made the same comments in, their, in that communique, in our communique at that time. And so this is, this is an important step in recognizing um, uh, the value of, of exchange rate stability in growth and investment. As a former Treasury official, it's um, um, uncomfortable to ask another question about exchange rates, but let me tie it to NAFTA, which is one of the, the things that you mentioned, NAFTA modernization. Of course, that's being driven by the U.S. Trade Representative's office. Treasury isn't uh, you know, the central uh, player in, in that renegotiation, but there is the, the, uh, the element of, of exchange rates that was in the negotiating objectives um, in, in achieving uh, greater discipline on exchange rate matters in NAFTA. Um, is this, but I haven't heard, or we haven't heard much talk of, of this um, in the actual discussion of the NAFTA negotiations. Is this something that we're trying to achieve some new outcome in NAFTA on exchange rates? Uh, there will be consideration of uh, exchange rates as part of, of the NAFTA process. That, so under the Trade Promotion Authority, which uh, is the grant of authority from Congress to do, to, to do trade negotiations, there's a, uh, a request to uh, take account of the of currency impact on trade. So what I would just observe is that as you as you are engaged in a trade uh, agreement, with, either bilaterally or or on a broader basis, uh, but, but especially bilaterally, the the uh, uh, the the exchange rate uh, is part of the terms of trade, and so it uh, it undercuts the purpose of the trade agreement if there's wide, uh, if there's intervention, if there's manipulation of the currencies, if there's wide movements or competitive devaluations of the exchange rate. So I took note of that in my prepared remarks. Okay. Um, so G20, you are the finance deputy, um, which means you're responsible for um, building the agenda or working the agenda with the other G20 finance ministries um, and the finance track of the G20. You touched on a couple of the priorities, but if I can start by saying the, Argent the Argentines have set out three big objectives, um, which are um, future of work, uh, infrastructure, and especially mobilizing private capital, which you touched on, and uh, food security, I think, is the third uh, big issue. Um, w w how is the finance track going to contribute on those issues? Which of those do you think are the priority? You know, how do your interests in energy infrastructure and so forth fit into, or how will the G20 help to advance those uh, priorities? It's a constructive process. We've worked closely with Argentina uh, and uh, uh, including on the infrastructure initiative. One challenge in the G20 is there are uh, many groups around the world who uh, have become accustomed to um, to creating their their work projects are around a, G, a centralized G20 process. So what we've done within the G20 is encourage uh, uh, the 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 uh, the group uh, to recognize the value of streamlining their efforts into work streams that are really important for the current environment. Um, but the, a problem has been that if there's a G20 every year, uh, what has been happening is that the work that people agree to five years ago or even 10 years ago doesn't stop, it just expands. And so there's been a sprawl uh, of, of these projects. And so w the, the US is, uh, is working within those groups to wind down the work streams, issue a final report, uh, move on to other current projects for the world. That turns out to be harder than you might think. So there are 
dozens and dozens and dozens of meetings expected for countries. It's one thing for the U.S. to be able to afford, but countries uh, throughout the G20 uh, that don't have as 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 uh, as big a government as ours is uh, are also participating in far-flung meetings uh, that you look at the agenda and you can't really see what the purpose is. So we're we're uh, actively. Uh, requesting that various work groups uh, 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 in, finish their work and then let the people move on to other projects. That, of course, has caused lots of pushback because there are organizations around the world that kind of depend on new assignments uh, coming forward. So we're working with all of that to make sense. We want, we want projects that really benefit the people and that are truly cross-border kinds of projects. So uh, we're happy to work on the infrastructure project with, uh, with Argentina. Great. Well, if I can offer an editorial comment as a former G20 yak myself, uh, amen. I think, you know, trying to, to streamline the agenda and focus on things that, you know, this group can uniquely um, advance, uh, you know, specific um, actionable um, outcomes is, I think, is the right way to go. So if you can do that, but good luck with that. It's hard. Thank you. Um, and think how good it would be for Latin America if one of the outcomes of the G20 is instruments that allow investment in infrastructure across the region. Yeah. So that's one example. Right now, if you, if, if you are positive on the changes going on in the region and want to simply have a passive investment in infrastructure, a basket of infrastructure projects, very hard to do that. Uh, and so that, that would help uh, allow new investments in the region, which as, as many of us know, is so needy of new infrastructure. That's, that's a yawning gap in, in almost all of the countries of Latin America, even in the United States. And, and so uh, let's work on that together. Great. Um, I'm going to bring the audience in in a second, but just one more um, topic area, which is not a, a really Treasury's main area, but you touched on it again, which is trade. Um, a lot of us, again, were struck by the President's comments in Davos about the possibility of the U.S. rejoining the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, so first of all, is that something that would be realistic, and what would, need, what would need to happen for that to be real? What would we need to improve about TPP? And then how does that fit with the, the preference or the, the stated preference for bilateral FTAs? And, and, and if we're going to pursue bilateral FTAs, you know, who's, what, what's the priority there? which countries. Right, so let's be clear, we are interested in bilateral FTAs and the reason for that is because you can see more clearly what the terms of the negotiation are, what the benefits are to the American workers and so we've expressed interest in that both with Japan and with uh, the UK. The UK is involved in in uh, uh, its own trade negotiate trade related negotiations with the European Union uh, and so that there's a time cycle on that with Japan we've expressed tr strong interest in a bilateral uh, uh, agreement with them they've uh, t so far been more interested in uh, uh, in in uh, multilateral discussions which has uh, uh, which ap apparently has has uh, reached the TPP-11 uh, that, that they've been engaged in, uh, which, which is fine. What we would like to see is more countries growing. That benefits American workers. So if they can find a way to have constructive trade agreements that actually liberalize markets, Japan is a case in point of a market that would benefit substantially from trade liberalization, uh, then, then, uh, then that's good. Uh, now, as far as then the U.S., uh, 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 relationship with TPP. Um, the, 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 the point that that negotiation had reached in uh, 2016 wasn't uh, acceptable to the president and beneficial to American workers. And so what's changed, several uh, circumstances have changed that make the possibility of, of, uh, of d discussions. One, one is uh, that there, uh, there is a different negotiating environment now that the, that the U.S. is able to, to do. Uh, strong 
uh, negotiators that are looking out for American workers. And that's, so that creates uh, an opportunity that wasn't there, wasn't uh, taken, that, that didn't occur in 2015, 2016. So that, that's uh, an angle. And then I think also the, the faster global growth that's occurring now creates some latitude for, um, for constructive outcome. But above all, it's simply that the president's very uh, uh, focused on having trade outcomes that benefit American workers. Where there are opportunities for that, um, that then there's interest. Okay, great. Um, so I'm gonna bring the audience in. If you have a question, there are microphones. Please raise your hand, a microphone will be brought to you. And please identify yourself and ask a brief question. Um, so this gentleman in the second row, please. Hi there, uh, my name is An Shu. I'm a reporter with Inside US Trade. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. We've talked a lot about China today. I wanted to ask about the investigation, in, uh, the Section 301 investigation into China's intellectual property practices, if we can expect any action from the administration on that. Uh, thank you. Actually, could you just hand the microphone forward to Senator Kirk? And we'll so uh, the, the, the question is on the 301 uh, investigation. The U.S. Trade Representative uh, and Bob Lighthizer and his uh, team uh, lead that investigation. And so I'm going to leave uh, the timeline of that uh, to, to them. Thanks. Okay. Senator Kirk. Uh, we, we, uh, I remember talking to my friend Wang Kishan where they talked about all these calls coming into the Chinese Sovereign Wealth Fund. How are we doing? What are we standing to lose here? Could you quantify for the Chinese middle class the, psi, the order of magnitude of the, uh, what I would call the Maduro risk for non-market uh, uh, transactions from China to, uh, to Venezuela? Are we talking about China losing 50 million or 1 billion, what is, the, what is the magnitude of the risk to China's investment? Yeah, uh, thank you, Senator. Um, so that's, that's a good question and I won't have a specific answer. So we, we think Venezuela's debt, uh, the government may have run up $150 billion of various kinds of commitments. Now, whether those are actually, you know, uh, the many, some of those w have, were not approved by, in, in a constitutional process by Venezuela's um, uh, National Assembly. Uh, they, you know, they've, they've created a, a separate non-constitutional process called the Constituent Assembly uh, that, that, and so some, some uh, 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 debts are, are not actually being approved by the people of Venezuela or any constitutional process. So it's hard to know what that number is. As far as China's then uh, size of it, it's a big chunk. They're the biggest creditor of uh, Venezuela. They haven't disclosed the terms of what they think of as debts. So if you're a person sitting in China, you're, you, there are agencies of the Chinese government that are entering into so-called contracts in Venezuela with the idea that they will be paid over a period of years in barrels of oil. So think what that does to the patrimony of Venezuela. You're a person in Venezuela and you're expected to watch your, the, the resources of your country ship off to China for a period of years for what benefit that that you receive. There's no food. There's the, you know med medical care is uh, has gone uh, uh, sharply downhill. So that's the way I would characterize that. I, it's hard to put a concrete number on it because China doesn't participate in the Paris Club, doesn't disclose the terms of its loans, and in fact makes them opaque by taking the contracts in oil barrels. Great. Okay. Other questions? Yes, sir. And then I'll take the gentleman in the back after. There's a gentleman up here in the yellow. I can speak very well. Well, no, we need it for the, uh, for the cameras. There are people watching online. Thank you. Uh, stand up. Oh, my. Pardon me for not wearing a tie today. Um, uh, Rick Johnson. I run International Government Affairs for Citibank. Uh, you've alluded to the need for better regulatory coherence cross-border. 
Uh, and one of the work streams that the FSB has had real difficulty tackling is exactly that topic. Uh, where do you think the department, where do you think this administration can go in improving that situation? Perhaps within the context of NAFTA, but even in a larger context, strikes me the FSB is perfectly suited to do something far more tangible than it's done thus far. Thank you. Um, so we're discussing the Financial Stability Board, which is based in Basel and, uh, uh, and has an effort to find standards in uh, international banking regulation uh, that, that uh, will, will uh, improve financial services for people. Um, and so the, the questioner is making the point that if you had better provision of cross-border services, that would help people. And that we know in very much in our own experience in the U.S., but all around the world, when, when, uh, when a new uh, technology is allowed within a country that allows people to eat, have access to their bank accounts or to swap money uh, or to uh, make loans that actually can be made across borders. It has a big uh, gain in terms of growth. <clears throat> so I share the, the, uh, the sentiment. As far as what can be done, I think simply recognizing that, doing the work to find, and I, so I mentioned in my remarks the significance of having a passport process among the, some of the major, the alliance uh, within Latin America. We think that's significant. We want to help that process and work with that. And that's an idea that if you're, if you're registered uh, in one of those four countries, then that, there's mutual recognition of that in other countries. And so um, th that's an example of, uh, of a process that can be facilitated. Um, w w and this is a little bit of an aside, but uh, one challenge uh, in world growth is within Europe, there haven't been that many cross-border transactions, so it's not a, a problem unique to Latin America. The rules of each country are enough different that it makes it hard for one financial institution to buy or invest in another country across the border. So I think that's something also that the European uh, Union and European Commission can work on in order to facilitate that kind of cross-border process. So if, as they do that, that creates a learning experience within the FSB that, that is applicable. In fact, the passport system that, uh, that I mentioned in my remarks is to some extent patterned off the relationship that the UK had with, uh, with, uh, the, with the others in the European Union. And so there's a learning experience that can go on. So I guess I'll, I'll stick with that, that the FSB can help cause dialogue among uh, countries and then learn through best practices. Thanks. Great. I think there was somebody in the far back and then this uh, woman here. And this will be last. And that will be the last two. Yep. Uh, greetings. I'm Thomas Ward. I was a former economist at the World Bank and I was part of the organizational effectiveness group um, trying to improve the effectiveness of the bank. Um, but looking further, and that was why your comment was interesting on that, but looking further you got the um, president of the bank focused 100% on his capital, um, working capital addition that he's seeking. And with that, you know, the talk here has a lot of been about Latin America and there's, as an anti-money laundering specialist, there's a lot of focus on is Latin America gonna change the corruption issue going from Brazil to um, Peru to Chile and so forth. Um, and there's a lot of talk that it could maybe change it around. And last week there was a great- Is there, is there a question? Yeah. Well, is, do you think that Latin America really can change it around on the corruption front and lead it for the rest of the corruption. world? Okay, well, why don't we take the, the young lady uh, up oh. here in the front and then we'll, and then we'll close out. So, okay. um, actually, you can start answering that if you want. Uh, uh, yeah, that'll, uh, uh, I'll, I'll try to address that. Yes, Latin America can uh, make progress on that and that means resolve in each country but also learning experience. So I mentioned the Odebrecht uh, uh, scandal, so that was a a, a deep corruption uh, sta scandal that touched on 
many countries. Uh, um, and so the, the, we can have a, some optimism that countries are addressing that and changing their practices. I, I, I would, I'm interested in the OECD uh, 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 corruption standards uh, and, and their applicability. Uh, you know, I, I think one of the things that will help growth is if there's some common standards that are tough standards on corruption that are followed by company that can be followed by companies in the U.S. around the world uh, that uh, uh, that uh, then allow investment to confidently take place in a non-corrupt environment. I I think that's beginning to happen in Latin America, and we can try to help it. Great. Final Thanks. question. Yeah, the uh, International Affairs Office at Treasury was in charge of putting together the report to Congress on the impact of sanctioning Russian sovereign debt. Uh, that report has, the unclassified version of that has been reported today in the media. Are you able to elaborate on why it would be bad for the global financial market to sanction Russian debt? That effort is led within Treasury by the, by the terrorism finance uh, side of Treasury, which I don't head, and so I don't have a comment on that. Um, okay, well, we uh, know that you have a lot of other work to do. We appreciate uh, your time and the breadth of coverage of issues here, and, and you were very frank and, and uh, responsive, and we really appreciate that. We're very interested in all the things you talked about here at CSAS, Michael's program following the Americas, of course. We do a lot of work on China. We do a lot of work on the G20, on infrastructure. We've got a big project on that, and we'd love to have you back on any or all of those topics or anything else uh, you'd like to talk about. Thank Super. you so much. Thank you, Matt. Please join thank me you, in thanking Undersecretary Michael. Thank you all. Thanks so much. Thanks. Is this your work?